Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So I, 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 we finish our discipleship school today with, I think, one of the best stories in the Bible, uh, in, the old story, in the Old Testament at least. And, and it comes into the New Testament. You can guess all you like, but I don't know if you'll guess it or not. But Genesis chapter 12. Abram, Abram is a... a his, his dad is an idol worshiper. We don't know much about him. We don't know why the Lord came to him. We don't know anything other than the Lord found him, came to him um, in chapter 11. And uh, he's in, uh, in the Ur of the Chaldees, modern day uh, Babylon, I believe. And... Um, He speaks to him prophetically and says, because Abraham, we find out later, is a prophet. And part of being a prophet is you hear from the Lord back in those days. He's, get out of your own country. Get out of your country. From your family. And the Lord often does this as part of discipleship. He's learning. To, he's going to, he's never, he doesn't know the Lord. He's about to know him. And um, there's something about getting away. And I, I, the reason you're here this past 10 weeks is it's important that you get away and get away from your family and get out of your country, get out of what's familiar. There's, you learn differently. You hear differently. Uh, there's some people who uh, are always in touch with home or while they're here. And I don't think they get very much out of, out of the the, the experience. And there are people who uh, take mission trips and never really leave home. Uh, they're still in constant contact with their family and friends. And I think it's a disadvantage. He's get out of your, uh, away from your father's house to a land I will show you. So he's taking him someplace he's never been, which again is discipleship. God wants to take you places that you've never been, not geographically, but spiritually. Then he says this, I will make you a great nation i will bless you i'll make your name great and you shall be a blessing uh, when i was a young pastor we had one of the poorest churches in town one of the smallest churches in town and i this verse got in my heart it worked its way into me became a major promise we had nowhere to go but up and uh I, I went and uh, got my paintbrushes and, and a ruler, and I made 12-inch letters on the wall of our little tiny sanctuary, and I painted on the wall, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. And that's, that's the whole thing. We're blessed to be a blessing. It, we're not just blessed for our sake, but blessed to be a blessing to other people. And he says, uh, I'll, I'll curse him who curses you. I'll deal with him who, who deals with you. Anyone who touches you negatively, I'm all over that. You don't have to do anything. And that's a promise even to this day. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that's a profound thing. When you think of Judaism, when you think of Islam, when you think of Christianity, it all goes back to this moment in Abraham's life. And of course, he's talking about Jesus Ultimately, uh, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through the Messiah that comes from Abraham. So Abraham, he left off. He's 75 years old, departed home, took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and uh, all their possessions, and they headed off into the great unknown. And now he's pregnant with a promise. He's pregnant. They can't conceive. You can see that in, in chapter 30 or chapter 11, verse 30, they can't conceive. So Lot's kind of a son to him. It's his brother's son. And, um, but they think that you're going to be a nation and that all the families are going to be blessed through you. I mean, it's just, it's an over-the-top amazing promise. And uh, so he heads off on this promise and almost immediately runs into difficulty. And so that often happens when you get a prophetic word uh, or you get a promise that the Lord puts in your heart. It doesn't get better. It often gets worse, it gets more difficult. Right away, there's an economic crisis 
When there's a famine in the Bible, it's an agricultural society. When there's a famine in the Bible, there's no food. There's no business. There's nothing to buy. There's nothing to sell. It's serious. And so he has to uh, manage, you know, keep his family alive during this famine. They go down into Egypt. And uh, because Sarah is very beautiful, he almost loses her, which would affect the promise and uh, affect God's purpose. And the Lord intervenes. And, uh, you know, he, he, the thing I like about Abram is he's a man just like us. He lies. He tries to get out of his problem with half-truths. We do that when we're afraid. We do that when we're not fully trusting the Lord. Well, it's reasonable in the sense that he didn't know the Lord. He's getting to know the Lord. He's the first person in the Bible whose walk with the Lord is documented. And, and his faith is growing incrementally. At this stage, his trust in the Lord is not that great. He tries to save his own skin. The Lord has to uh, confront uh, Pharaoh. And uh, anyway, it ends up... Uh, he comes out of the situation richer than what he went in. If you look at chapter 13, verse, verse 6, he's, he's coming out of this time with livestock, silver, and gold. And there's something, there's something in God. If you're a disciple and you're sincere and you're walking with the Lord, it doesn't even matter when you miss it. It doesn't even matter in the sense when you, when you really blow it you will come out of that thing richer than what you went in. You're, you're going to come out with faith, which is gold. You're going to come out with finances. You're going to come out with an experience. And um, he, he come out of this thing. And he actually, what's interesting, interesting is he ends up back in the same place he was when he left before he went down into Egypt. So he comes back full circle. And that so often happens in our experiences with the Lord. And then there's this whole thing with, with, uh, the, the, with law. And they have so many uh, uh, workers now, the big flocks, herds. Uh, verse 6 of chapter 13 says the land's not going to be able to support us. There's tension. There's strife between the herdsmen. And so Abraham does something that this is his, his first real major extension of faith. He, he says to Lot, take whatever you want take the best land take whatever you think you want and because i don't want any more strife but you could only do that if you have this thing growing inside you this sense of blessing that it doesn't matter what you do and it doesn't matter what you take i'm i'm okay i've got the blessing of the lord it's like he's been given this massive credit card that he'll never max out. And he's got this in his heart by faith. It's a promise. He's pregnant with a promise. So Lot takes the best land. And it just about ruins his life. You know the story. He goes down into Sodom. He goes down into the plains of Sodom. But it was really the best land. And, and Abraham's fine with that. And so he goes out for a walk. And um, the Lord speaks to him, says, Abram, uh, you can see this in um, verse 14. He has an, an, another encounter with the Lord. And he says, look up, look around you. Everything you can see in every place you put your foot is going to be yours. So he's given him this promise of, of blessing in terms of land. He gave away some land to Lot, but God says, look, every, everything you can see, I'm given to you and to your descendants forever. Walk through the land. Go. Take, walk the length of it. Walk the width of it. I'm going to give it to you. It's a tremendous promise that comes. It's called now the blessing of Abraham. It just seems like it doesn't matter what happens to him. He comes up smelling like a rose. He comes out ahead of everybody. I want that blessing. I want that blessing on my life. I want, I want, I, I remember as a young pastor wanting to grow, but not wanting to take other people's uh, sheep, other churches' sheep, and, and just, 
other pastors would scheme and 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 draw people in and I was just free of that. I knew his blessing was resting on me. I didn't need to make my church grow. I never advertised. We didn't even hardly put out a sign. We didn't need to do any of the typical things. Uh, we were told that, you know, you, you can buy this program where every phone book, this is back when there were phone books. You probably don't remember that time, but uh, there, you know, every number in your, in your area, uh, uh, a phone call, or uh, a, a, a card could go out and try to get everyone to come to your church. Well, it was, it was a way to grow. We just felt we had the blessing of the Lord. We were so satisfied with that. Uh, and, and we saw it, we saw it come to pass. So then Lot gets in the trouble and there's these biker kings who, uh, who come in and steal him and all his stuff. And um, I think there's four kings. I'd mentioned recently there were five. I think there are four here. And they, they are bad guys. Uh, they're warriors. They're, they're always robbing and marauding and, and uh, fighting. Abraham's not that kind of guy. He's more like a Mennonite guy. He's a farmer. He's, he's, he's a shepherd. He, he, he doesn't even have a sword. But he arms his servants, and it tells a specific number in here. He arms his servants with, I think, implements, <laughs> like goads and, and sticks and farm tools. And they go after, and they run into the teeth of these four nasty kings, and he wins. He wins wins the battle, he gets everything back, he gets his family back, he gets all the stuff, but he doesn't want it. Uh, there's this whole thing with this exchange with him and the king of Sodom. And uh, um, Abraham raises his hands before the Lord and says, I don't want anyone to say that they blessed me. I'm going to be so wealthy, but I don't want anyone to take credit for it. I raise my hand and I will not receive anything short of God's blessing. I just want, that's all I want in life. And he doesn't receive even a shoelace from all the booty, all the stuff. He doesn't want any of it. Then he runs into Melchizedek, and the first thing he does is he tithes. Well, the reason you can do that is you're full of the blessing of the Lord. A lot of people say, well, I can't afford to give 10%. Well, you can if you know that that's not the end of it. That's not all you have. That you got this credit card in your chest that just allows you just to go through life knowing that everything will be taken care of. It's a profound thing that he could fight and win a war up against some really bad guys because he feels protected. He feels this blessing. He can give because his provision isn't attached to the circumstance. His provision is is part of the blessing of God. And Melchizedek, he comes out with wine and bread. He's a priest, uh, priest of uh, the king of peace. And uh, uh, he's, he says that he's blessed of the, of the God. Verse 19, the God who possesses heaven and earth. He's the guy who owns everything and he's got your back. He's, he likes you. And... Um, I love this verse 22 and 23 are very precious promises for me. Uh, Abraham says, I've raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I'll take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, that I will not take anything that is of yours, lest you should say I made Abraham rich. He said, accept the young men, give them, give them what they want. But he's just, he just feels provided for. I want you to know this. I want you to experience protection and provision that doesn't come out, about, come out of how clever you are and how, how powerful you are. It comes out of now, listen, it comes out of the blessing of the Lord. The blessing of the Lord is everything. And you, you don't want to lose it. You want it to grow. You don't want to do anything that compromises. You want it to grow. And so 
Abraham gets into this whole covenant thing in chapter 15. He's human like us, and so his wife says, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I want this promise too. Uh, I can't conceive. My womb is barren. Why don't, you take, uh, why don't you take Hagar and sleep with her, and maybe we'll get a child that way. And that's just like us. That there's, even though he's a man of faith, and he's learning, and he's growing, he's walking, he misses it. And, and all you need is an Ishmael or two in your life, a business that's an Ishmael or a project that's an Ishmael. And it really, it really teaches you, well, I, I, all I need is the blessing of the Lord. I don't need to manipulate. I don't need to make anything happen. Uh, you'll get to a place where you don't want any more Ishmaels. But even the Ishmael... And Hagar are tremendously blessed. The, the story of these guys, you just see God caring for them because of his friend Abraham. <coughs> so it just goes on. He gets into this major covenant. He has a son of promise. Uh, angels show up and tell him the, what's coming ahead. Say, so how, how can we keep this hidden from Abram? He's a, he's a Abraham, he's a friend of God. He gets a name change in the whole process. He goes from Abram to Abraham, which means the father of the multitudes. Can you imagine that moment when you get this name change <clears throat> and you're moving from place to place? But maybe, maybe you go into town to get a haircut and the barber says, hey, old timer, you're new in these parts. I've never seen you before. What's your name? And he doesn't want to say, and he kind of shakes his head and thinks about it. And he says, no, what's your name? Well, my name, my name, my name, my name is Father of the Multitude, Father of Nations. That's my name. You are Father of Nations? You're the Father of Multitudes? Are you kidding? I, I, your caravan doesn't look that big. How can you be father of nations? And he says, I just am. He says, well, how many children do you you know, have, especially sons? How many sons do you have? That's a sign of, of, of great blessing and wealth. And he says, none, none. But he has a name. And God will do that kind of thing. He's the God who calls things that are not as though they were. I picture him and Sarah before they leave town. She sees this baby buggy and looks at him and he looks at her and he says, go ahead and buy it. So she's pushing a pram and, and on, the back of the, on the back of one of the, the camels as they're leaving town is this little yellow triangle that says baby on board and it's swinging on the back end of the camel because they're pregnant with promise they believe that this is going to happen powerful story and then there's abraham and abimelech uh, verse 7 chapter 20 verse 7 says that abraham's a, a prophet god defends him this man takes his wife and God shows up in the dream and confronts the Lord. That's part of the blessing of God. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to manipulate circumstances or people. God, God will defend you. God will take care of you. And uh, every, Abraham just was so blessed that Abimelech is jealous. Uh, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. God looks after him in chapter 23 with, for the burial of, of uh, Sarah. And there's this whole negotiation, this very um, interesting Middle Eastern negotiation that says, take the land. You're a great man. We'll give you this land. And he says, no, thank you. But, but I want to buy the land. And he says, well, what's that between me and you? Here's the price. <laughs> and then, the, you know, and, and Abraham, Abraham doesn't want a discount. He, he wants to own that piece of property where Sarah is buried. Verse 4, chapter 23, verse 4. I'm a foreigner. I'm a visitor among you. 
And to this day, Abraham has the deed to that property. It still exists. You can still see it. It still exists to this day. And um, it just goes on. I mean, he wants a daughter for his son. Who doesn't, right? And, um, and his servant is sent to go find. And, and he says, maybe God will bless my servant Abraham. And the first girl who comes out the water who, to offer the water, our camels, may that be the one that you've chosen. And it, and it happens to be the, the exact one. Uh, that God has chosen, chosen it's Rebecca. And uh, here she is, a teenage girl. She doesn't know. How. She's going down that morning to get water, and it's cold, it's hard work, it's big jugs on your head and on your shoulder. You get wet doing it. We see it happen in India where the girls go down and get, get the water twice a day, and it's, it always strikes me as cold, hard work. And not only that, all the girls run back to the village. They see the stranger sitting there, and only one teenager goes back and she says, sir, and she's full of hospitality. She knows what pleases the Lord. And she says, sir, can I water your camels? Not knowing that good deed, she's, be, she's about to become the richest teenager on the planet. <laughs> and before the day is out, she's be, being bedecked with jewelry and gold and clothing and heaps of perfume and all kinds, best makeup kit you've ever seen. All this stuff because she decided to, her life touched Abraham. And all of a sudden she's blessed. I just think that's a powerful thing. You can just go through life, doesn't matter who touches you. If they touch you for good, they're going to be blessed. If they touch you for bad, feel sorry for them. <laughs> and it's just part of the blessing of God. And it just goes on and on and on. I mean, it's just an amazing story. Uh, he gets married again, and, and he marries Keturah in chapter 25, and they have kids. I mean, it just, it's an amazing, amazing story. I love the story of Abraham. I didn't for the longest time. He was just like, to me, this old sheik in the desert. I didn't really relate to him. But when I started pursuing faith and walking with God, I found out that in my life, the blessing of the Lord is everything. And this guy had it. He was the first to get it. Plus, what's amazing is the promises and the blessing of Abraham is ours through Jesus Christ. So Paul writes about it. And uh, <clears throat> he writes... In Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, chapter 3, verse 9, Galatians chapter 3, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham was for those who walk by faith, like Abraham, and the, it's on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, verse 14, that we are heirs, verse 29, 329, actually verse 3, 26, then 29. We are Abraham's seed through Christ and the inheritance, the inheritance, don't worry about it, the inheritance of Abraham that went from him to Isaac and then to Jacob came right down the line through Jesus to you. Even though we're Gentiles, far from God, living in another land. We are the nations that we, he was prophesied about. And we have the blessing of Abraham. You can face any crisis. You can face an economic crisis. You can face war. You can face people trying to steal your, steal your stuff. And you can face it all knowing that the God of Abraham, the possessor of heaven and earth, has got your back. And here's what's really wild. Abraham's God is my father. And he could never say that. Abraham's God is my dad. That's such a profound thing. I hope that works its way down into your heart. 
It allows you to navigate life free of fear, free of manipulation, free of control. You can just go through life and everything works for your benefit because you love God and you're called by Him. And, and it just makes life easy. Amen?